Uh, so as she said, I'm Eric Smalling. I'm a senior developer advocate at Sneak, but I'm not really going to be talking about Sneak, so don't worry, not a vendor pitch. Um, we're going to talk today about uh, hacking Kubernetes. So you can get a feel for where I come from. You can read that if you want. I'm a developer background. I'm not an operational background. A lot of Kubernetes folks come from a sysops and learn development. I kind of came the other way. Um, I have about, depending on how you look at it, 30 years of software dev experience and DevOps experience or whatever. Um, a Docker captain, have, you know, the CKS and all that good stuff. Um, been using Docker though since early days, like 2013. And I have a tweet of Solomon mocking me publicly that old, so you can go check it and check my, my uh, if I'm telling the truth. If you care, my, I'm Eric Smalling all over the socials. Uh, but what we're going to talk about today, and, and forgive me if I keep touching this, this is my notes, and I'll be doing things with it, so sorry I had to have that in front of me, but you know how it is. Um, but we're going to be talking today about how the combination of app vulnerabilities and misconfigurations can allow an attacker to spread the blast radius of their attack. And of course, we're going to be talking about this in the context of Kubernetes, because that's what you know, every, every talk today pat almost is. Um, that pattern of exploits to uh, expansion is kind of how most of these attacks come, ab come about. An application vulnerability gives an attacker the initial foothold, and then um, infrastructure level misconfigurations can allow that attacker to spread into other parts of your system. So um, we're gonna walk through an app vulnerability to, from, from going from an app vulnerability to basically owning a cluster. Now this of course is, we only have, you know, 45-ish minutes. This isn't gonna be a full-on, you know, huge demonstration. It's gonna be fairly contrived, very on rails, so you can kind of follow along. But what I'd like you to see is, what are the, some of the things that, if you stand up a Kubernetes cluster, if you don't think about, you don't customize, you don't configure, how they can bite you? and what you can do to head those things off. So, setting the scene. Um, we're going to pretend that we are a, a hacker and we have found this vulnerable server out on the internet. We don't know much else about it other than that it has this particular vulnerability. For the purpose of this demonstration, this is just a mock Flask app that we wrote that has a remote command execution vulnerability. Um, it's, what that means is it's gonna allow me to run commands um, directly on the server where that web app's running. It's a simple Flask app, honestly, but these kind of vulnerabilities do exist in the wild. Things, uh, software like Tomcat or, uh, gosh, Sp Spring Boot or basically anything in Java if you were running Log4j in the, in the last year. Um, <laughs> you can craft, uh, pass, uh, a hacker can pass malformed or specifically crafted requests in, you know, by HTTP or whatever that allows them to run commands on that server. So. While we go through this, I'm going to have this timeline of doom that's going to show us as we go along from the left where we have found a, a vulnerable container in this case. And as we go to the right, we'll see the things that uh, lead up to escalated uh, ex uh, exploit. So enough of slides. Let me get over to the wonderful hackable app. So of course, this is very, again, contrived understand that this could very well be any, any RCE you've seen out there, if you have seen them. Um, but this is gonna be, I've done this so that it's easy to see it from uh, the point of view of uh, the audience out there. So the way this RCE works is we have found that if we pass a CMD into this ad, web admin context, you can pass a string into it and it's gonna run it. It's pretty bad. So I just ran who am I on, this technically is running over here on this machine, and because I'm not brave enough to test the, uh, the demo guides that much, I'm running kind on Docker desktop uh, just on that machine. I'm using this machine so that you can see that, A, first of all, because it's an Intel machine and I have some images that aren't cross architecture, this M1 machine has problems with that, but B, so that you can say I don't have Docker running over here, Docker engine, I don't have kind any, or anything running here where you're gonna be looking at, so it's all remotely connecting over there. Um, so what I've hit is uh, the front end of that. I just passed a, a, a command in. One of the most interesting commands I might do as a hacker is I want to see what I can get out of your environmental variables. And here, is that big enough or do you need me to grow that? Oh, is it cut? Okay. Yeah, let me, let me drag this. Better, better. Cool. So, there, so here's all the environmental variables that are in the environment of that Flask app that's, that's uh, 
you can see. And there's a ton of Kubernetes ones. So that's, aha, I'm running in a container, I'm on Kubernetes. Uh, I can also see other things about it. But one of the interesting ones that you can see from this point of view is this Kubernetes service host. There's another one in here actually that I usually look for. Kubernetes ports right up top. So this internal 10.IP address, that is the API server from the point of view of this, of this pod. Uh, that is the control plane. If you're not a Kubernetes expert, that is where you send commands to Kubernetes to do things. It's, it's the API endpoint. So what else can we find out? Let me copy this. And I'd kind of like to know what is the IP address where I am. So I just did an IP space A, and it looks like I'm at 10.244.162.135 inside that cluster. This is the pod's IP address. Interesting to know. And what else can I find out? Let me open another one of these. And actually, I'm going to copy from my notes over here because it's easier than typing. So this is what happens when, you, when a presenter gets off script. I have to find it in my notes. Sorry about that. Um, so <laughs> live demos, folks. It's the way you do it. Uh, so I've got that. I'm going to do, I've figured out what IP I'm at, and I'm ignoring my slides because slides are boring. But I'm now going to cat something that is too long for me to type. So copying, copying from iPad, that's always fun. Paste it right into here. I'm on Apple, all oh, right, look at that magic. What is that? That is a token. So what I've done is I've gone to the default place for the service account token for a pod. That is the, uh, the credential, if you will, that this pod can use to talk to that API server. Now, those of you who are Kubernetes savvy may know that that is in versions 123 or older, defaulted to true to auto mount that in every pod that you start. Thankfully, Kubernetes has made that default to false starting in 124. This is a 123 cluster. Um, in fact, if you run on most Kubernetes clusters, you're going to not be on 124. That's why I continue to show it right now. So hopefully soon enough, that, I'm uh, sorry, I'll grow that so you can see it. That's just EKS, just I pulled it as an example. If you're starting up an EKS cluster, you're probably still on a 122 or, or earlier. Um, so many clusters you're gonna see out there are still running an older version because 124, that's bleeding edge crazy. Who would run something that's brand new? Well, if you're not, and you're not explicitly marking service, uh, auto, uh, mount, auto mount service account token to false in your service account uh, definition, you're gonna have this thing available to basically every pod out there. Well, what can I do with that? Well, let me go back to our timelines. What, what do we know right now? So we know we can hit this, this thing from port 80 from the outside. Um, we know from the port information in those environmental variables that the, it looks like it's a service listening on 5,000. We know the IP address of the pod. Um, and now we know that we have the pod token because it's available to us inside, the, inside that pod. So now I'm going to take another string, copy it over here. Do, 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 copy, come on. Copy. And we're going to replace, I'm gonna go back and overwrite this one. So what this is, as you can see the, in the larger text here at the top, um, what I've done is I've run curl. Now curl's in my image, yay, I can use it, fun. Um, so now that I have that, and I, now that because that's available to me, I can pass in the, uh, into the authorization bearer that token that we found earlier. And I'm assuming the CA cert is right next to it because that's kind of the default place for it as well. And I hit that endpoint IP and I'm going after the default namespace endpoints. And sure enough, I got a response. So token's good, API endpoint's good, and I can get at the default endpoints. Now, why do I care about endpoints? Because it's often open. That's one that uh, is a good one to check. But another interesting thing here, if I scroll to the bottom, you see that um, IP address? That would be the publicly facing IP of the, cluster, of the um, API server. So you see port 6453 on that IP. Now, 
in this demo, it's not because I'm running inside of Docker Desktop, which wraps things in another, v, you, know, it's with, you know, all the layers that you have there with kind and everything. So I'm not gonna actually use that IP here. But if this was a KubeADM started Kubernetes cluster in your development environment, say you started up in a sandbox off of your vSphere, that very well would be available. Um, luckily, and I'll throw this in as, uh, most managed Kubernetes clusters do not expose it that way. So managed Kubernetes clusters for the win. However, um, let's take what we've found here. And I'm kind of tired of using, well, actually, I should show my slides because we're moving along the timeline of Doom. So we now know that the internal IP of the uh, API server works and that the Todd token allows access to that endpoints API. So let's go back to what we had here. Um, I'm kind of getting tired of using this RCE website because it's kind of cum cumbersome. I'd like to actually get at this uh, server from a command line. So I'm gonna copy this whole token. I'm gonna come out here, and just like I said earlier, just to prove a point, I am not connected to a Docker engine at this point, and I do not have K alias to, or kubectl alias. Uh, if I get to try to get something, I'm not connected to a Kubernetes cluster at this time. I do have in this directory a little setup script that will create a kube config from a token, just because I'm too lazy to do one myself. And I'm going to use the host name I know. This is where I would use that IP address if this was a regular Kubernetes cluster. Are, are, we, are we cutting off? Sorry. Better? Cool. So basically, I just created a, 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 a kube config file. I'm going to export that into, oops. Ah. Is it, oh, is it off the bottom? Okay. Give me a second. It's over scan. Come on, grab the corner. How are we there? Yep. Okay. Clear that. Uh, we're going to export. Oh, gosh, my history is all screwed up. There we go. It's going to export my cube config. And now, if I try to get something, it is going to demo gods please work. Hey, that's actually a good sign. I'm getting an error from the server. So I am connecting to the Kubernetes cluster and that token is actually working. It's just telling me that I'm not allowed. So it tried to pull pods in the default namespace and it's saying you're forbidden. You can't do that. That's craziness. Why would we let you do that? But it exposed something to me that's interesting. If you look at this error, let me grow that font some. It says that user system service account secure web admin can't do this. The namespace secure is where that service, that, what that, is, that pod is running in. So let's try this. Git pod dash n slash secure. Don't confuse the word secure with meaning secure here. This is just the name of the namespace. <laughs> Naming your namespace secure does not make it secure. <laughs> so I just did a pod. Now I, I was able to do a git pod on the secure namespace and I got one. Let's see what else I can do. Uh, let's do an auth. Can I, oops, can I dash dash list. We're gonna pass the token in. I think I still have it in my, nope, I don't. Let me go copy that again. Copy, paste. So if, I'm gonna have to shrink that font just a little to make it fit better. So if you're familiar with can I, it's, it's basically asking the API server, what can I do? What can I, using that token, do? And that user, in the default namespace, because I didn't provide one, is able to, let me shrink it a little more because it's so ugly. Um, endpoints, as we saw earlier, can do any of the verbs in the default namespace. But really, there's very little I can do in the other um, resources with this. But if I use the same command and I pass in secure on it, namespace secure on it, you can see the very first uh, resource is the wildcard with create, get, watch, list, patch, delete, delete collection, and update. I can do a whole bunch in this namespace with that service account using that token. So that's handy. Um, let's see if, uh, I'm skipping through some notes here, uh, you, we can, um, well, let's go look at our, let's see what we know about this now. So we now know that there is a secure namespace, and there's always a default namespace, so we have some namespace data we know about. And let's see if I can use this. K 
Okay, get pod n secure so I can see the name of it again. Let's do an exec. IT in the secure namespace. And I don't have my autocomplete configured, so I'm just going to copy and paste. And I want to run bash. Yay, I can do that. By default, I am the web admin user. That's good, at least I'm not root. That's, that's the, somebody who's listening to one of my talks. Uh, let's see if I can sudo. No, sudo is not available. That's good. That's good. They at least didn't have that in there. Um, let's see, where am I? I'm in this user SRC app. Let's see if I can make a file. I can. So I am in a read write file system. Why does that matter? Well, uh, let's go back to our little slides. Um, oh, I skipped one here. It was talking about the fact that our role, um, we have too many permissions, honestly. All of those permissions for this pod, this pod probably does not need all these permissions, especially if this is a business application, it probably doesn't need any of them. You don't need to be talking to the API controller if you're an e-commerce app, most likely. Um, you probably don't even know where you're running in Kubernetes. Um, so limit your permissions as, as uh, appropriate. The read write file system piece though, um, what that means, the read write root file system, when a Docker or Containerd or Cryo or whatever starts up a container, it layers a read write file system at the top on top of the read, the read only image. That's where all your mutation happens. So if you make a file, you create a file, you edit a file, it does a copy on write, brings the thing up there and makes the mutations at that read write layer. If you pass Docker, for instance, dash dash read only, or in Kubernetes, if you use a security context and set read only root file system to true, it just doesn't put that read write layer there. This is not a silver bullet, but it does make it harder on a hacker to hide their tracks, customize your app configurations, delete, you know, delete logs, do, do things to modify um, that container. If I happen to be root in that container and it's a read write file system, I can very likely run app get inside that container and start installing other tools in the space of the container. Now you may have detection for that kind of a thing with intrusion detection systems or whatever, but it's better to head it off than react to it when it happens, in my opinion. So that being said, let's see if we can get our privileges extended. Um, so this is just showing we know we, know we have a PS, oh, I, that's actually, I'm skipping ahead. Don't look at that slide. Let's see if we can do more. Um, so I have a few manifests here I'd like to try to apply. Uh, let us let me get out of the exec and I'll show you one of them. We're going to do demo YAMLs, root pod YAML. So this is a simple uh, Alpine image I want to start up, and I know that by default that Alpine image runs as root, so I want to see if I can get an image in there that'll get me root in a container on this cluster. So let's do apply F into the secure namespace. Oops, put the file after the F, Eric. Demo YAML, root pod, and it says it created it. Let's do a git pods on the secure namespace, Let's see what's going on. Create container config error. Hmm, well, let's do a describe. Let's see what's going on here. Describe pod secure root pod. Error, container has, a, um, has run as non-root and image will run as root. So the kubelet, when it tried to start this container up, detected that the default user is UID zero and said, oh no, we don't allow that. Now why did it say that? Well, we probably have a pod security policy or something in place to restrict that. And before anyone says pod security policies are going away, I know that, we'll talk about that in a minute. But you can see in the annotations, sure enough, we, we see a PSP resource called restricted has been annotated onto this pod. So we have a PSP and that was the the giveaway here is we have a PSP um, in place. But let's see if, um, so I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna kill, delete that root pod so we don't have it sitting around. Trying to start. I've got another one, of course. We'll look at demo YAMLs. Uh, which one am I doing now? We're going to do the non-root priv. So this is a little bit bigger. This is, uh, we have an image called Sneaky, 
that we're going to try to deploy that actually wants to start as the privileged, in, in the privileged context. I want to be a privileged container. Um, and I want to do some nasty things with mounting of volumes here. So let's try applying that. Uh, non root priv. Immediately got an error. This is a pod security policy. So you know we, we had good evidence. We had one before. This one tells you right here. Pod security unable to admit pod. Um, privileged containers are not allowed. And that's by default. That that's normal. That that's uh, is most places would would restrict that. Um, but let's try something else. I'm going to run another one. Demo URL or YAMLs. Non root non priv. This is the same thing without the privilege or the or the volume mounts. So same image. So we'll go ahead and K apply into secure. And it says it created it. And it's running. So I, we have that running. Now I am going to, I'm just going to go ahead and exec into this. And this is insecure. It's called sneaky. So there we are. We are inside the sneaky pod. And I'm going to you know, say, who am I? I am the user sneaky because again, non root is, is set where it can't run as root. But this is my image. I do have sudo in there. And now I'm root. So why was I allowed to do that? If, if privilege is, is disallowed, why can I do that? Well, that is because um, this isn't really actually that clear in the Kubernetes documentation, surprisingly. If you set your security context to um, privileged false, that does not make allow privileged escalation redundant. That is not defaulted to um, false. It is allows it, as, as you can see. So um, what we see here is we have a pod security policy that's, that A, has too many permissions. You shouldn't be allowed to be you know, doing a lot of this stuff, and especially the fact that it doesn't you know, have the restriction on allow privilege escalation. So uh, that's the next step in our timeline of doom. So now we are root on a container in your cluster. Now we're in a container. So what, what could we do in a container? Um, let's say, go back over here. I would like to know what's the IP address I'm at right now. 10.244.162.141. If we go back to our prior, do I still have that open? No, let me uh, rerun IPA. So this is 10.244.162.135. This is 144, so I know I'm in the same subnet, so I, I kind of, you know, getting my uh, bearings set, I'm, I'm in the right place. But now, uh, I'd like to find out, I'd like to poke around. I want to see what's going on in here. So I'm going to copy another command over here because I can't type this long one. Copy, clear my screen. Oops, that is not what I wanted to copy, sorry guys. Copy. <laughs> Apple. Okay, we're going to start typing. We're going to run nmap. If you're not familiar with nmap, this is a tool for scanning networks. And we know that our, our service is listening on 5,000. I'd like to know if there's any other copies of this app out there. Uh, dash dash open in the 10. Dot, what was that? I have to go back and look at my IP address. 244.162.10.244.162.0/24. So we're poking around. Because I'm root in a container, I can do this. That's one of the things you need ev elevated uh, privileges to be able to do. And of course, this is going to sit here and take forever. Um, <laughs> come on. Oop. It did not find one. Oh, that's not good. That's not what I want in my demo. Do I need, I don't have to provide the full. Hold on a second. Do, 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 do. 
What did I do wrong? Sorry. Maybe I have to give it my IP. That would be weird. One six two one four. I'm also not a network engineer, so what I am expecting this to return to me is it, that we find another one. We find another IP address listening on port five thousand. And because we've been looking around in this network, we know that only one uh, pod is running in the secure namespace. That means it's somewhere else. And why is this not working? I'm sorry? There are, right, but one of them is the sneaky pod. Right, but what I'm looking for, let me copy this whole IP. Maybe I'm just doing this wrong. I've slept since I've gotten this far in my demo. What I'm looking for is another of the exploited or exploitable applications running in another namespace is what I'm hoping to find. And normally, That's not oh, sure enough, there it is. Oh gosh, see, I'm blind. You, you get blind on stage, folks. Sorry about that. So yes, yeah, so 135 is the original one. And that's the one we see here. Thank you. <laughs> 136. I'm going to bring you up here and hand over the keyboard. Um, 136 is something else. Somebody else is running at 136. And I'd like to find out who that is and, and what's going on there. So in order to do that, in this exec, I am going to run SoCat. And I'm going to SoCat, uh, so socket uh, cat. It's like a tunneling tool, if you will. It's more than that, but that's what I'm going to use it for. Uh, we're going to do a SOCAT, and we're going to get lost in my own notes. I scrolled it off my screen. We want to do a TCP listen. And we're going to listen on 5001, which is an open port. Use a DDR, fork. And we want to send traffic to 10.244.162.136 on port 5000. So we've got a socket listener going right there, right there. And now what we need to do on our local console, I'm going to open another tab and get out of fish because fish doesn't like me today. Am I in the right directory? I'm going to go to work, get... And I am going to do a, sorry. This is what happens when you have too many laptops. So we want to do a K port forward into the sneaky, oh wait, hold on, export, there we go. K port forward into sneaky pod at port 5001 on the secure namespace. So if you're not familiar with that command, kubectl has now reached out to the sneaky pod. And we, because we have that token, we can get to it. There was the same token that we exact it with. And we have opened a tunnel up from my local host where kubectl is running on 5001 through traffic hitting local host at 5001 will hit sneaky pod at 5001, where we in turn have a SOCAT tunnel listening at 5001, pointing at whatever that thing is on 5000. So I'm going to go back to my browser, open a new tab, we'll hit local host, 5001, same app. Surprise, surprise. Some developer apparently is running the, another copy of the app elsewhere in the cluster. So we're going to do the same kind of thing here. Um, and I'm going to, actually, I'll just copy it from over here. Run the same, I'll just copy this whole thing. And get rid of the front end of that. There's, a, there's what the token from wherever that's running. So let's go back now to our command line. And open another tab. Actually, I don't need to open another tab. I'll just, uh, I don't need my port forward after that. Let's get out of there. And we're, I'm just going to edit this kube config file. Oops, where am I? VI. 
demo cube config. Oh, it's just not visible. There we go. And I'm going to comment that out. Paste that in. Is that indented right? I think so. And now I'm able to get pods in default because that guy is running in default because this is a development cluster maybe. This is some place where he has access or she has access to deploy into the default namespace. But I think you can see where we're going. <laughs> um, so what have we found? Um, no network controls are in place. So nmap, besides the fact that I was able to get in as root and in run nmap, I could have installed it if I needed to probably. Um, I obviously don't have any network policies in place or other firewalling that's keeping me from perusing around outside of my namespace or outside, you know, places I shouldn't go. And this technically could be somewhere else, but it's nice that it was in the default namespace for me. Um, we found a, a pod listening on 5000 somewhere and then determined that it's in the default namespace by going and getting its token, using that now, and we were able to access pods in the default namespace. So now I'd like to see if I can get a privileged pod into the default namespace. So we'll come back to the command line and let's go back over here and I'm just going to go ahead and get out. We don't need that SOCAT anymore or anything. So I'm going to get out of there and I'm going to do a K apply into the demo YAMLs. Why? Oh, I'm not out of the pod. Sorry. K apply into the demo YAMLs. And we're going to go back to that non-root privileged manifest I showed you earlier. But we're going to deploy it to default. And sure enough, that worked. Um, that's because the namespace wasn't restricted by the pod security policy that was in place. And this is more common than you may think because developers writing an application for their namespace often will craft their pod security policy or other restrictions for that namespace, deploy it to that namespace, and if your cluster ops aren't restricting default, default won't be restricted. And sure enough, somebody decided to start the app in default, and I was able to get in there through all the things we've said, and now, I'm, now I've got a pod running in default. So let's go ahead and exec into that. And do, 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 do. Go into non root priv. Oops, not boss. Bash. <laughs> there we go. And I am able to become root. And if you remember from that manifest, we were mounting the root file system from the host. And we put it into. Well, there's more in there than I thought it was. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in there. We have a volume that at slash cheroot that it's mounted to. Handily named, because if I do a, let's do this. If, let me do a PSX to kind of make this more dynamic. If I do a PS right now, I'm in the process space for this, for the process namespace for this container, right? So all I'm seeing are the processes running in this name, in this container. That go TTY, there's another piece of the demo I could be showing you or I could get a web TTY, but that was too fancy for me. Um, but if I now do a cheroot, which changes the root, change root, of the current shell to whatever I'm going to tell it, I'm going to change it to the volume named cheroot or the directory. And if I do that same PS AX again, there's all the PIDs on the host. Because the way PS works is it looks at the proc file system for that kind of stuff. And the proc file system in this container, effectively for this shell, is the one that's on the host. I now have basically host access on this worker node. Uh, so that's bad enough, but what can we do more? So let's come back and see what we've got. So uh, we have no restrictions of the default namespace in the PSP. That's obviously bad. Uh, we now, we, we want to get at, what do we want to get at? We want to get at CD, right? If you're in a Kubernetes cluster, you want to get to etcd because that's the keeper of all things. And that's over on the kube system namespace. And we're not there yet, but we do have a privileged container over here in the default namespace. 
So let's, let's see what we can do to continue to expand this exploit. Um, so right now I am going to, so what, what I want to do is a, from this pod, I want to try to connect to Cube system. I want to get at something in Cube system. Um, in order to do that, I, I know my sneaky pod has kubectl installed in it, and I have the tool, but I need a key that can get me, a token that can get me over there, and um, the default token's not going to do it, but what is on every node that might have it, especially if you have root access to the host volume. I'm not going to CD to it, but uh, I'm going to export kube config to Etsy. Kubernetes kubelet.conf. That's the default place kube admin, or most people will install the token that kubelet uses to deploy, to do its things, to talk to the API server. So now if I do a kubectl git pods in the kube system namespace, I can see them. Ooh, in fact, kubectl git nodes. Yay, I can do that. So I already showed you that slide that we, we now have, um, well, I've showed you the privilege. I don't need to show that again. Um, I need to see something here, though. Let's do kubectl describe pod in the cube system namespace. I want to take a look at that Etsy kind control plane. Is that right? Yes, that's right. What I'm looking for here is where on the control plane host PKI, uh, the, the, the tokens for etcd are. And etcd search volume is, etc, is, the, is the standard place. But I, I know where it is. And this also should show me it's on node kind control plane. So that's interesting. So let's see if, hold on a second. I'm gonna come back out here to my other shell. I'm back out on my laptop now. And I'd like to try to apply with the token I have, um, Oh, wait, I'm sorry, skipping my notes around. One moment. Oh yeah, sorry, okay. So if I try then back, back, uh, back in my sneaky pod, if I try to do a kubectl, um, run, I'm going to try to start up a pod. I'm going to try to start a busy box. Manage equal busy box, restart equal never, dash dash shell, forbidden. I knew that was going to happen, but that's the first thing I would try, but I can't do that because the kubelet ironically enough, cannot start pods. It can start containers, but it's, it's actually restricted by default from creating them. Now, I could go et edit Etsy manifests, Etsy Kubernetes manifests and add a static pod to that, a, sh a shaded, uh, shadow pod, mirror pod, sorry, um, and start one that way. That's no fun, I don't wanna, I don't wanna mess with that. So what I'm gonna do is, um, let's do this. I'm going to, I've got another, obviously, I have tons of YAML. I'm going to run another one that is an etcd client. And you can see that this is going to start the uh, Kubernetes etcd image. It's going to set a bunch of things. Now I've already filled this in with the info we saw there. Um, it's going to try to uh, connect to the etcd endpoint and uh, get access to things. So let's do 10 minutes. Oh, I am hitting my time. Okay. Uh, K exec. 
not exec, sorry. Okay, apply. See, now you got me all flustered. You're showing me the time. F demo URLs, or YAMLs, etcd clients. So we're going to start up this etcd client in the default, and we're going to get in there with uh, etcd clients. Thank you. This is why paired programming works. Uh, and I'm just going to type this because I know where it is. Local bin etcd CLI member list. Oh, no such file. Oops, maybe I don't know where it is. Exec etcd. Did I type wrong? Dash dash user local bin etcd ctl Eric. Duh. Okay, so we did get a good connection. So we know that we actually, even though it didn't like this, it gave this warning, we did get a connection. So now I'm going to modify that to, instead of doing a member list, I'm going to get dash dash keys only from key grep. What do we want? We want secrets, of course. That's what we always want out of etcd. And there's the list of the names of all the secrets. Yeah. Um, when the one I care about is, let's see, where is it? Cluster role aggregation controller token. What can I do with that? Let's copy this line. Copy. Edit this. I'm going to do an etcd git on that. Right, right, right. There's a token. Let's see what I can get with this. Let me grab from there to there. And we'll do a k auth. Uh, can I dash dash list? I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to hit the get to the end of this quick. Oh, we must be logged into the server. Hmm. You know what's probably happened is the, something has been upgraded behind my back, and I'm not, and it's no longer vulnerable. Hmm. Come on, demo, do your thing. There it is. It just didn't like the uh, the annotation at the end. So what we can see here is cluster roles are back authorization kates.io escalate git list patch update watch and that Greek means you are God on this cluster with that token. So if we go back to our notes, we were able to get over there. Cluster rights gained. And that is the end of your server as far as you know. So how could we have prevented this? I talked all throughout some of the things you could do to this. But the first thing is scan your application code. Don't let RCEs get into your, uh, do your best to not let RCEs get in there. And honestly, that, that contrived Flask app, if I throw that through a, a Python static analysis scanner, I mean, I know ours catches it, but they should catch that. And sure enough, ours does. It'll say high vulnerability here. You're running a command from unparsed input. Don't do that. Scan your container images for the same reason. Scan your Kubernetes YAML for best practice. There's tons of scanners out there. Use them. Don't trust your defaults. Be explicit about things. Specify in your pod security policies or admission control whatevers to not allow permission, uh, uh, privilege escalation. Use network policies. They are your friend. I know as a developer, when a lot of us think network firewall rules, it seems complicated. I have to open tickets for that. Network policies is really not that complicated. Um, doing it right takes you know work, but you want to make sure you're using that tool that's available to you. And use admission control. So I mentioned PSP is being deprecated. It's going to be removed in the next release. It's been deprecated since 121, I believe. Um, and pod security admission is coming along. But the, your admission controllers that are popular out there today, your OPA gatekeeper, your Kyverno, you can do a lot of the same things with those tools. And they're very popular. And there's a ton of support out there for it. So use some kind of admission control to enforce what you would normally do with PSP, as well as a lot of these other things. Don't let um, people deploy to the default namespace. You know, just don't. 
Um, finally, I just want to give thanks to a bunch of people. I've only listed a few here, but everybody in the SIG security, um, Mark Manning, Ian Coldwell, Duffy Cooley, um, Chris Nova, all these people out there, we, we, a lot of what I've learned here, what we've presented to you, I've learned from listening to these, these people. Um, so uh, SIG security, TAG security, OpenSSF, all these groups are there to help us learn security and implement it well. So I just want to thank them all and, and tell you to join our SIGs, hang out with us. And now, with the time I have left, I'm open for any questions you might throw at me. I'm going to take a drink. Yeah. Awesome. Please raise your hand if you have any questions, and I will come over with the microphone and hold it for you to avoid contact. All right, let's start with you over here. Pardon me. Uh, thanks for the great talk. That was awesome. Um, can you give us any um, examples of like a safe default configuration that we can just set up? A, I, I know it's a silly question, but just something for a complete security dummy, like use this on your kube cluster, and at yeah. least you're not going to be stupid. Um, without pitching for anybody or any single project, there's a, there's a lot of kube scanners to scan your, your clusters to tell you whether or not your cluster itself is meeting CIS standards or other standards. Kube Bench is one of them. Um, in fact, if you're doing the CK, take the CKS, get, the, get your CKS cert. You will learn a lot about these, these kinds of things. But uh, there's a lot of tools out there um, that, to implement these from many vendors. Um, particularly Sneak, actually, we don't do runtime stuff. So uh, I'm not, I'm, I'm not I'm going to pitch us. I'm going to you know, say, look at the open source projects that are out there. Um, if you are on a um, managed Kubernetes from a distribution, often they will bake these things in, because that's why you're paying them. So uh, EKS, GKS, uh, many of these things that I did aren't as easy to do there, because they've already set some, you would have to undo some of the things they're doing to uh, attack them. So I would say pay attention to the vendor you're using for your Kubernetes. Don't be undoing things. So if, for, for instance, the service account token auto mount that is going, went live in 124, when 124 gets rolled out, if your apps all break because they're trying to talk to the API cluster, question why, talk to your developers. Why do you need to talk? Why do you even know you're on Kubernetes? Are you doing a monitoring tool? Okay, let's talk. Are you doing a business application? WTF. Why are you even aware that you're in a, a container? You know, so. That kind of stuff. Does that help? Anyone else? Well, cool. We'll all be around afterwards. We got a break after this, so I'll, I'll be hanging out. Um, if you have any questions, um, like I said, join us in SIG security, tag security, open SSF, supply chain security, all those things. I hang out. Yeah, I promise the Kubernetes community is super friendly, super welcoming. Um, thank you so much, Eric.